Hi, I'm Jill Siegel for Off the Shelf. Today, I'm in the studio with Lisa Oz, who is co-author of the best-selling You, the Owner's Manual series, wife of Dr. Mehmet Oz, co-host of the Dr. Oz radio show, mother of four children and now, author of the new book, Us, Transforming Ourselves and the Relationships That Matter Most. Best-selling author Kathy Freston calls Lisa that rare gem of a wise sage and down-to-earth friend. While Dr. Dean Oyner says, Lisa Oz is a shaman in disguise, a genius of the soul, powerful, authentically funny and wise, and Us is, quite simply, the best book about transforming our relationships that I've ever read. Hi, Lisa. Thanks for joining us on Off the Shelf. Thank you for having me. I've never had a shaman here. <laughs> Very exciting. Uh, in Us, you talk about three different kinds of relationships. Can you tell us what they are and how they relate with each other? Yes. Um, I feel that our relationships lie in one of three areas. Our relationship to ourselves, our relationships with other people, and our relationship to the divine. And how are they connected? Well, I think they're all interrelated and inseparable. Your relationship with God is, is demonstrated and shown in your relationship with other people. And your relationship with other people is influenced by how you feel about yourself and that relationship. So you can't really extricate one from the other. The first part of the book, you talk about finding your authentic self. What are some of the ways that you outline in the book for doing that? Well, there are primarily two techniques I talk about in the book for getting in touch with your true self. The first is non-judgmental observation. It's just to be able to step outside of your emotional, habitual reaction and see what you are doing from an outsider perspective. That way you stop identifying with the habitual response. And once you stop identifying, you stop having to defend, having to protect, um, because it doesn't feel like a death when you have to change your behavior. So you, once you're non-identified, you can start to change. So what's an example of that? Well, an example would be in traffic. If you're driving down the street and a car swerves into your lane, you instantly become angry. You take it personally. It's as if they did something to you on a personal level. If that same driver pulls into the lane on the other side and cuts off another person in traffic, you observe that they're a terrible driver, but you don't get all angry, you don't flip them off, you don't, I mean, you don't act in a way that is an emotional response. The objective with the non-judgmental observation is to have that secondary response in your own interactions so that you can see what's happening without getting emotionally involved. Right. And it allows you just to disconnect and then allows change to be, to be accomplished more easily. The second technique um, that I use in the book for, for uh, getting in touch with your authentic true self is something called the Enneagram, which is an ancient um, system of personality typing. No one knows exactly where it came from. They know it was used by the Desert Fathers in the early 3rd, 4th centuries and by the Sufi mystics later on. It was brought to America by a mystic named Gurdjieff in the early part of the 20th century. And it is basically a personality typing into nine different categories, um, which show you how you respond fundamentally to a fear that was developed in early childhood. And do you respond to that by being overly ambitious? Do you respond to it by being an optimist um, and in denial? Do you respond to it being a helper or a perfectionist? There are nine different ways that we respond to our uh, inherent insecurities. Though when you see what ways you respond, you realize that it isn't unique to you, that it is a habitual response that, that you've come to fall into. And um, again, it allows you to shift from that repetitive, reflexive behavior and make what can be um, uh, a fault into your, your greatest gift. So what type are you? I'm a six. And what does that mean? A six is we respond to fear by being aware of that fear. We are anxious about everything. We are worriers. Um, we analyze everything. Um, we are, are fraught with anxiety. I right now I'm wondering if the cat has eaten my rabbit. Um, <laughs> that sort of thing. We worry a lot. Now, um, can you use this to 
influence your relationships with other people? You know, like he's a seven, he's a four. I belong. You know, like astrology. I mean, you can. It's not what it's intended for. It's really initially in many spiritual directors practice, they wouldn't even tell you about what the other nine numbers. Once you had your number, that was the only one they'd tell you. Um, but it's the only reason really to even engage in figuring out what other people's numbers are is so that you can be more compassionate in their habitual responses when they respond in a way that's typical for their number. For example, my husband is a three. And when he is overly engaged in his work, when he will make sacrifices that I would not make from of my family for his job, I can be a little more compassionate, understanding that that is who he is, in large part because he's a three. Because and what is a three? A three is the very ambitious, very, very, very <laughs> ambitious. The need to succeed, the fear of failure. So the response to the initial fear is that of achievement, and that's how you. Sixes worry about fear, and that way they think they've they've controlled it because they've imagined every possible ba bad thing that can happen. Threes just charge forward and conquer the world, and that's how they address it. So the point of knowing someone else's number is really just to be more compassionate. And what about knowing the number for yourself? How does that how does that help help you? Well, one is to be more compassionate with yourself, but the other is to be less attached to it. Because if you if you realize it's not unique to you, it's not something that y that is um, something that defines you as an individual exclusively, and you can see that it's a pattern, you can and you recognize it and become aware of it. Again, you can change it, and it's all about change. For me, it's all about growth and transformation and change. I have to say that that part of the book. Everyone who's read it so far can't stop talking about that and trying to guess their numbers, and it's so fun. But that's really just the tip of the iceberg. You go on to talk about the relationships with everybody else, from your children to your husband to the homeless man on the street. Um, so let's talk about relationships with your spouse. As you said, you and Mehmet have been married for 25 years. How have you done that? <laughs> well... How would I not? I mean, that's the. Someone said to me once, they're like, "How do you deal with Mehmet being on call all the time back when he was a resident?" Um, and my only answer was, "I can't even imagine the alternative. I would rather have little bits of time with him than no time." And um, I think that we both have made our relationship a priority. Um, we both have made sacrifices for the relationship. We um, appreciate each other. We look at the big picture. Um, we both are good at saying we're sorry, and um, and knowing that the sum of us together is greater than us as individuals. What are some of the problems you see with that parents face today, and and how would you advise them moving forward to be a better parent? Well, you know, parenting is such a, an amazing challenge and incredible gift, and it, it it takes you to every extreme of your of in range of your capabilities. Um, it's such an easy place to make mistakes, and because no one gives you a book on how to parent, you don't ha take a class in college on how to be a good parent, and it really is about relationship. Um, knowing where your ego boundaries are, knowing when it's not about you and it's about them. Um, I do think, and one of the points I make in the book, is the idea of walking the talk. I mean, kids see what you do and do what you do. So if you smoke and you tell your kids not to smoke, there's zero chance they're listening to you. If you lie and you tell your kids not to lie, I think we all do that one. Um, again, Curse words. Curse, <laughs> curse words, yeah. Very guilty There's of that. There's so many areas where we expect our children to have a higher standard of behavior than we do, and I think that's dangerous. Um, another one is giving your kids the, uh, the freedom to make their own mistakes um, and allowing them to 
mature and grow and have responsibility on their own, but at the same time providing a safe space for that to happen. Um, it's very easy, especially as kids get older, to say, yeah, go out, whatever, and especially when they say, oh, my friends are allowed to see the R-rated movie, or all oh, my friends are staying out till midnight, to not want to have that fight, and to not just, it's easier to let them just go. Um, but I don't think that's the right decision. I think it's really important as parents, because you do have better judgment than a 14 year old and you have to use that and to set up boundaries so that you do create a safe space where your child can learn and experiment and make their own mistakes. One thing that really resonated with me was the idea of being a conscious parent um, not looking at your Blackberry while you're supposed to be listening to stories. Do you find that that's that, that that's a common problem? For most of us in this society it is a problem um, between the television, the phones, our computers, email. You you have so many distractions that even when you're with another person, you're not really there. You're on your BlackBerry having a conversation with someone that could be you know 200 miles away and not noticing the person that's sitting right next to you. And as as a mother, one of the things that I found is that I like to drive in the car with them with the radio off. Because once the radio is on, we're not talking. We're listening to whatever's on the radio. So what I try, and again, it's all an attempt for me. This is a process. I do not have this down. You don't I, have a perfect life? No, I do not have a perfect life. I am not the Uber mother. Um, and sometimes we actually do listen to the radio. But I am attempting to be more conscious in my parenting, to be more aware, to be more present, just to spend time with my children where we're actually connecting, where we're not just sitting next to each other. It seems that a common thread among all of this is being aware and conscious of everything you're doing and thinking and decisions you're making. What about with God? How does that play into it? For me, you know, on one level, the relationship with yourself is the foundation for all other relationships because it's the it's that one factor that comes into every relationship, the relationship with the other people, relationship with God. but. For me, the relationship with God is the most important relationship because I think that colors how you see everything else. So Einstein said, do you see the universe as fundamentally a friendly or an unfriendly place? For me, the universe is God. Is God a friendly God? Is, does God have your back or not? And is God a God of compassion, a God of um, love, a God of tolerance, or is God something else? So I, I think that how, how we connect with the divine um, and how we see the divine is really the f core of who we are. What if you don't believe in God? It doesn't have to be God in a, you know, the old man with a beard kind of vision of God. Um, God is a name that some of us are comfortable with, some of us are not. There is always something outside of ourselves, whether it's science, whether it is um, ethics, something that is bigger than we are as individuals, something that the Gaia, you know, the planet, something that underlies the foundation of our belief system. You are human like everyone else. <laughs> you sound pretty smart, but you're, but you're human. Uh, what are some of the, the things that you are working on in your own life in, in terms of relationships? Every single thing I talk about in my book is something that I am currently working on. And I don't, again, it, I don't think that, I would hope that I did not portray it as something that I've figured out. It's much easier to see what the goal is than to reach the goal. And I don't, it's sort of like yoga. I have this yoga teacher who I adore named Steve Ross. And he says that yoga is not about getting, achieving the perfect asana. He said there's no such thing as a perfect yoga pose. What makes it perfect is that you're doing it. And I think with the relationships is the same way. Relationships are always in flux. Any relationship on any given day can be a good relationship or a bad relationship. And I think that what makes a relationship useful and beneficial in my view is when we are aware that there is growth there, a growth opportunity for growth there, and um, when we approach it with compassion both for ourselves and the other person. Um, and again, this is not something I bring to the table in every relationship. You can, you know, ask 
my kid's principal. Um, <laughs> but there are relationships where I am not conscious. I would say all my relationships, there are times where I'm not conscious. But it's something that I strive for. So what do you hope readers come away with after having read us? Well, first of all, that, that they are their relationships. That who they are, who they can become, is in large part a function of the relationships. And the quality of those relationships ultimately determines the quality of their life. I hope that, that through reading my book, they'll, it will bring um, some awareness, some consciousness of their relationships. And maybe they'll be able to see themselves reflected in my stories. I share a lot of myself in my book. And my reason for doing that is because I am just like everybody else. The things I struggle with, I'm pretty confident most of my readers are struggling with too. And so through reading it, I hope that maybe they'll get some resolution or solutions for situations that they may be experiencing and, um, and have a little more compassion. Lisa, thanks for joining us on Off the Shelf. Us, Transforming Ourselves and the Relationships that Matter Most is published by Free Press. For more information about the book or Lisa Oz, log on to www.simonandschuster.com. Thank you.